Good evening, and we are in the studio tonight, and my name is Ndumiso, and we are doing a show from the front line with Dr. Peter Hammond on the mission to Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal. So, Dr. Hammond, do you have any information for us on how the mission went? Yes, well, uh, Mpumalanga is always a great place to go to. I mean, that's where one of the greatest national game parks in the world is, Kruger National Park. What a magnificent reserve. And uh, near Mpumalanga's game reserve is Barberton, and about 30 kilometers outside of Barberton in the rolling hills in the Valley of Mercy is Back to the Bible Mission, who's right. been celebrating 30 years, last year, 30 years of operating, and Frontline was part of it from the very beginning. We had uh, two of our missionaries uh, helping uh, with the starting of this. Well, it's grown phenomenally in the last 30 years, and for 15 years, I've been on the faculty as a guest lecturer going in every year for at least a week, sometimes two weeks, to give missiology lectures, history lectures, and others at different times. Uh, it's run by General Shai Mulder, who was once head of the engineers, and Taniel Reza uh, Mulder. Now, both of them, when they retired at about 60, went back to school. And they were very well educated, all kinds of degrees and doctorates and so on beforehand, engineering and so on. Well, uh, once they started 21 years ago to run back the Bible, they did their, the, through uh, the University of KwaZulu, they did BA in theology, then they did MA, Masters in Theology, then they did their doctorates in theology and missiology. Uh, while running a mission college. And which, at that age. Which, yeah, 22 years. Uh, so uh, now General Mulder just hit 80 years old. Wow. Uh, so uh, he celebrated that earlier this year. And no thought of retiring. I mean, sort of like Caleb, give me that mountain. So what a joy to go to the end. And this is a big college, actually, because there's – 100 people on campus at any one time. There are about 114 right now if you count students and faculty and staff. About 60 languages spoken, representing about 20 countries around Africa. So this is a, you know, I don't want to use the word United Nations uh, because the place that calls themselves the United Nations aren't united and they're not nations either. At all. But, <laughs> but these, these are genuine United Nations as in United in Christ for the Great Commission, which is phenomenal. And what a joy to be there. What a great mission college. Amen. And uh, we understand that you were gone for what amounts to five days and had returned back to Cape Town. And then you well, that's another mission. I, I was uh, more than a week at um, Pumalanga. Pumalanga, yes. Yes, you. And you had time to visit the Kruger National Park and partake in all the... Yes, my daughter, Daniela, was up for a mission. She wanted to join me. Um, first to see Back the Bible mission, which she hadn't had the joy of doing. Her sister and her brother had, but not her. And then she was picked up by another missionary good friend of ours and taken off as part of a team to Mozambique. So still in Mozambique doing a mission to a school uh, up in the coast. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing about that. But I was then teaching missiology. But, you know, back to the Bible mission isn't just a college. It's, right. it's a place of worship and ministry. And do they take it seriously? The first day I was there, uh, Sunday worship service, uh, fair enough, um, and that was very intense, but not just morning worship service, evening worship service too. And then the first day of the week, Monday, where we have full lectures and everything else, they had a day of prayer and fasting, which uh, started 6.30 in the morning right. for a pre-devotions until we went at 7.30 to the main devotions. Um, and uh, that went all the way up to what's well, meant to be 9, but it was more like 9.30 when they finally finished all devotions, worship and so on, and got into the lectures. Of course, instead of lunchtime, there was more worship services right. and then session because on day of prayer and fasting, you don't need to prepare food or eat it. And um, there was all sorts of actions in the afternoon and a most wonderful Lord's Supper celebration at the end. What was also interesting is they have a practice at BBM before taking communion to encourage everyone to go and make right with anyone that they've got a problem with or anyone they think might have a problem with them. Right. So you've got this crisscrossing of the massive auditorium of different people going and you could see embraces and sometimes tears and uh, obviously people making right. And what a what a wonderful thing to do before yeah. Lord's Supper, actually. Exactly. And, uh, and then there was still homiletics preaching that evening and next morning starts really early again. And um, so it's, it's a full day and include PT... Uh, they always have me running PT on, on uh, Wednesday afternoons, and that was quite in-depth as well. 
and there's evening program one evening program I showed a number of our videos on Sudan and it was very intense more than an hour of question answers and That's lots amazing. and lots and lots and lots of enthusiasm so I mean these students they there was many a time when I went to question answers that it's gone for more than an hour more than an hour of just Q&A wow. so that was normal and so just to get to the curriculum was quite tough because at the end of the week there's exams right and we know that back to the bible mission used to be called back to the bible college um, is there any update on that status to to return to being called or accredited as a college we know the government has tried to give them a hard time oh. in the past and was there any uh, information that you got on your yes. recent visit yes they they believe uh, i mean i've i've found it hard to believe but they believe that the Department of Education is about to give them accreditation. But I think it's like they always have this carrot sort of dangling just in front right. to waste more time and money. So personally, I don't think that uh, seeking any government's accreditation for any Christian college, especially a missionary training college, is worth the effort because the time, the money. Because they don't do this for free. You've got right. to pay hordes of registration fees, and, and they waste your time. Oh, do this, do, do that. No. <laughs> and so they've been fighting this battle for more than 12 years, maybe 15 years. Uh, so uh, it's been a long battle to get accreditation. And the woman in charge, the committee chairman of this board that accredits him, Ikas or something, is a Muslim who actually came there and informed General Mulder more than uh, 10 years ago, but I'm closing you down. He said, you cannot do that. And he said, how can you say that? And he said, uh, this belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, at any rate, she, she issued instructions for him to be arrested well wow. when a police sergeant uh, contacted him to find out where he was he said well i'm down in the tell uh, when do you want me back do you want me back and meet no 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 you know when you come back well he walked into you know got a case packed and came expecting to spend time in jail came along to surrender himself to the police and the police looked at this and they said this is a lot of nonsense and then the prosecutor was sent for and the prosecutor looked at the charges and said this is Absolute nonsense. And so the prosecutor refused to prosecute. The police refused to arrest him. So here's this government agent who's trying to, who's a Muslim, right. who's trying to close down Christian colleges. In fact, the same woman uh, had boasted at, at a public meeting that in the last five years, we've had 1,000 Christian colleges apply for accreditation. And she beamed and said, and we've approved two. Wow. Two out of a thousand in five years. And she thought that was a good. A good job for her. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, fortunately, the police and the local prosecutors um, thought better of it and, and didn't pursue it. But as far as she is concerned, he should be arrested and the college should be closed down. And that's why they changed the name from Back to the Bible Training College to Back to the Bible Institute to Back to the Bible Mission because they were being attacked for, well, you can't say that you're a college or an institute and so on if you haven't got... And, well, of course, Bible college training, it doesn't matter what you call it. Um, right. But this is high standard. Here they've got double doctorates running it. They've got other faculty members who've got doctorates in theology and divinity. Uh, they have very high standard of guest lectures from around the world. Right. And uh, they have been approved uh, at different times. They were working well with uh, University of uh, KwaZulu, uh, with the University of Northwest. Uh, they have tried very hard to lay with international bodies. They've got such a high stand. They go through every book in the Bible. They've got, And since when is a secular government qualified to determine what constitutes good training for the pastorate or the mission field? Yes, that is unacceptable. And it's amazing that even after all this time, they still see it as an opportunity to to bog down on these Bible colleges and remove and strip them of their, their titles. Um, it's interesting that the uh, ANC government hires a Muslim lady. Uh, it's like it's a built-in bias already, and they can separate themselves from it. Well, I mean, imagine uh, in Saudi Arabia a Christian uh, deciding whether to qualify uh, Kalwas and uh, uh, Quranic schools and uh, right. A different mosque was saying, no, no, you don't qualify. And they would say, well, how could you possibly determine what's a suitable Quranic school? Which would be true. But, I mean, nobody would even imagine that you'd get uh, – I mean, imagine if Britain uh, was running around saying uh, this isn't a legitimate mosque or this isn't a legitimate right. Quranic school, close it down. And 
uh, I mean, you could only imagine people would be outraged around the world for it. Yeah. But uh, somehow or another in South Africa, there's a lot of cultures I know closed. In fact, one that's very sad is um, the uh, the uh, mission college. There was Africa School of Missions, started in 1985, uh, out in White River, not far from Barberton, and uh, they closed down because the government closed them down because they said they weren't accredited. Now they fell over themselves to be accredited. They got accredited with London Bible Society, uh, right. London Bible Institute. They got accredited with University of Northwest or Potchefstroom University. They threw their students dead with all this high, and it meant it was meant to be a practical missions training college. Right. And uh, I was going as a regular guest lecturer there, and, and I spoke to the students saying how many outreaches, and I heard from third years we haven't had any time to do any outreaches. A mission training school where you haven't had a chance to do outreaches in the last two and something years. And it was because they've been thrown dead with pastoral requirements, theological requirements, and, so and then missiology added on to it. So we're basically doing two or three different degrees at the same time. Right. And still the government uh, grinned and said, you know, you, you're not accredited. And they were accredited. With, In fact, their degrees would have been recognized anywhere in the world, but mm. not here. And in the end, uh, after a few years of this harassment, they were down to four students in this wonderful, massive, colossal facility. And and then they finally had to close their doors. So, And that, I'm told, has happened to hundreds of Bible cultures around South Africa in the last two decades that they have just squeezed out and closed. It started under Tab and Becky's time. He is very hostile to the church. Yes. And now, I mean, many of these cultures have run themselves ragged and bankrupt themselves yeah. trying to get accreditation. But uh, the way we operate, for example, with our William Carey Bible Institute online program is we neither would seek nor accept any government recognition or accreditation or support. Uh, and I mean, that's the way it's got to be. As a church, if you want to be independent, then you mustn't accept either government accreditation because if you ask them for permission, they can refuse it. Keep them trying and, to say no. And so it's like we are not pretending to offer a government accredited uh, a course right. and uh, it's for its own benefit and if people want government accreditation well they can go somewhere else right. because honestly I think these poor people who are trying it probably are the best intentions in their hearts I think they're just being frustrated right and as you visited uh, Back to the Bible uh, mission you've done it pre-COVID lockdowns and <laughs> somewhat towards the tail end of the lockdown and then now after the, yes. the lockdown have you seen any uh lockdown liturgy or any way it could negatively affect the college in the current... It, it definitely did. I mean, back to Bible Training College had something like 130 students uh, before the lockdown. Uh, now their students were about 83. Of course, there's more staff um, and uh, faculty as well there, but uh, still, uh, so the numbers have come down, but also uh, in the previous year, 2020, all they could do was study remotely, even if they were on campus. They weren't allowed out. They weren't allowed in the auditorium. And the um, the lockdown was very severe. So that the people weren't allowed to have fellowship. They weren't allowed to have sports. They weren't allowed to um, be in classrooms. And so it was just online. And not everybody's got internet connectivity, enough data. I mean, you can just carry on and on. So it was bad. And also, they didn't do any outreaches in that whole year mm -hmm. because of the lockdown. And normally... At, Thankfully, right now, they're back into prisons. They're back into the right. hospitals. And But for all that time, you think these poor prisoners, no visitors, no services, um, and same with hospital and then the outreaches, the taxi ranks and in the streets. So uh, I think this lockdown was disastrous. And these people are the best intentions of their heart, tried to adhere to all the requirements. But the requirements were unreasonable right. and unnecessary. And at the end, I think it just sucked a lot of life out. So there's many students and quite a bit of staff who just right. left. Which I'm sure was the intention. Right, exactly. And we all know that uh, Back to the Bible Mission uh, has a, a great culture of prayer and, uh, you know, being prayer warriors, uh, uh, General Shamulda and Elriza uh, are strong on that. Uh, was there any indication that that had slept uh, in any way while you were there in that week? Well, definitely not now. It's back up to high standard, and uh, you could see that with the a day of prayer and fasting and with the devotions and the worship. And uh, as the professor 
Mulder Wrigley says, your walk with God is even more important than your work for God. Right. And so, you know, the walk is the emphasis. And so every morning the students and staff share prayer requests, praise items, scripture memory verses. They focus in different countries from Operation World for Intercession. They really seek to be a house of prayer for all nations. And, of course, when I've got so many nations represented on campus, it right. makes it even more exciting. So frequently you will have the different uh, meals offered. Uh, for example, I, I um, saw the Ethiopian students, and it's quite a large Ethiopian student body, and they often do very well. Um, and they would be very happy to bring you their unique culinary delights. And so it is sometimes you've got the Zimbabwean or the Zambian and uh, so on. Um, so, yes, I must say, uh, all around Africa, um, the Back to the Bible mission, you can see posters to motivate like, Train hard, fight easy, uh, win Africa for Christ. They've got some stop signs that look like stop signs. And on the middle it says, don't stop praying for the nations. Right. And, you know, things like this, just very uh, thoughtful and highly motivational. There's a lot of great art and a lot of great scripture verses around. And what most dominates the landscape is as you come in, you can see this massive white cross dominating uh, the valley. And it's lit up at night with spotlights, which... Right means you can be anywhere in the valley and you know just it makes such a clear impact i'm sure the pagans hate it right but it inspires the christians right and uh has there any has there been any indication uh well you could uh, uh allude more to this since you were there for the past week uh, if barberton i know is a very small city and the valley of mercy is in the wilderness is there any indication that the students are in touch with the outside world in terms of all the bad news we're hearing about these next levels of, of lockdown and mm -hmm. these new diseases, all this bad uh, propaganda. Are, are they uh, diluted by that in their minds? Well, I think that the students on campus, because most of them come from other countries, are a lot more skeptical about what government says and what the media says. Anyway, I think... A lot of the South African students tend to be a lot more influenced by the local news and what the politics are. Um, originally, it was only foreign students, but they've, because of the lockdown, they've tended to be allowing in much more local students yeah. because many others are having trouble from foreign affairs getting their visas. And oh, we know how that goes. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, yes, uh, amongst, amongst the students, because they do outreaches in the local community regularly, uh, they are somewhat aware of what's going on, but it looks like the focus is so much more on the word and prayer and intercession, the Great Commission. So, um, so Dr. Hammond, um, what were you teaching on during this week? It was all missiology. So I started with missions in the Old Testament and missions in the Book of Acts and early missionaries in the Church Fathers in North Africa and culture and Christianity and cross-cultural communication, what it takes to be a missionary, Motives for missions, including false motives and false calls, bad motives, uh, the greatness of the Great Commission, the challenge of the greatest century of missions, uh, examples of excellence in missions, and why the greatest missionary is the Bible. Nine different ways of going, how to make disciples of all nations. And then there was also, of course, devotions and church sermons where I was dealing with marvelous mothers with a mission. I was there for Mother's Day. Hmm. And uh, your character determines your competence and do you have what it takes to persevere and then I was invited to speak to the student council and to the staff on the college. And uh, uh, there's the physical training side and um, special missions evening when we had a whole focus on Sudan. So uh, it was something like 20 odd meetings in the space of a week at the college, which included giving the folks a whole lot of exams at the end. Awesome. And everyone got a book. We managed to ship up. Everyone got a great essential missions book to be the owners, part of our libraries for pastors and that was the textbook they were basically being examined on were any of the from the front line uh, behind enemy lines uh, books distributed yes for the library and for the um a f a for a prize with one of the top students and uh, and also of course for the principal so yes i took some but you know wait when you're flying uh, it's limited right. that's why we shipped a whole lot of the books up ahead of time right and then you came back down and uh you went back up for another mission. That was to KwaZulu, yes. Um, I'd been invited to speak at a conference in Port Shepson, but just before departing uh, for this conference, I heard that our dear friend, Reverend Erlo Stegen of Kwasabunta Mission, was very ill, deathly ill, and uh, that he wanted to see me. So I was working 
how can I break away from this five-day commitment to the south of Natal? Quasi Subantu is way up in the north right. of Durban. So, uh, um, so I finished my duties by the Wednesday lunchtime and was able to break away and get lifts and get up to KwaZulu, uh, up to KwaZulu, and uh, I was able to get to Kwasabantu by late afternoon on Wednesday. And it was a great joy to be back at Kwasabantu Mission. I mean, it's got to be the most spiritually blessed, effective mission station on the continent of Africa. And when I said that some years ago, my father-in-law, Bill Bathman, who for 67 years was a missionary, and he worked in 114 countries of the world, he said, pity you can upgrade that to the world. He says, I've been in 114 countries. He said, I don't know any mission station anywhere that can compare with Cross Ubuntu, Amazing. Uh, either in depth or extent of ministry. And uh, I mean, you just think what Uncle Earl has built up there. He's been, as King Goodwill's Valentini said, God's apostle to the Zulus. And uh, Prince Mungo Sotobotelezi was also uh, many times a guest there, great uh, friend. In fact, Uncle Earl asked to see two people. He asked to see Prince Mungo Sotobotelezi, who got there just a few days before I did, and to see me. And so I had the opportunity to spend several hours with him on Wednesday night, praying with him, holding his hand, reading scripture, talking of eternity, reminiscing. We sang uh, at late on in the evening. All of his six daughters and quite a lot of his grandchildren gathered around and some of his sons-in-law. And we were able to sing um, and uh, pray with him. And uh, he's very weak, which is hard to see such a strong man uh, in a weakened state physically right. from his health. But he's uh, in his late 80s. He, he's uh, suffered a lot. Um, but he's in good spirits, and uh, he's at home. That's the important thing. He's at home with his family, and they're caring for him. Uh, but um, surrounded around him, I mean, the first thing that's so amazing about, about Uncle Olo is he's got six daughters. They're all married. They're all living in and around his home with his 24 grandchildren. I mean, isn't that just that's extraordinary? Amazing. Because many South African families, their children Split are up. everywhere. Canada, and the grandchildren, Australia. <laughs> Prison England, Island, right. you know, under Trudeau's uh, KGB and all the rest of it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's bad. Right. But, uh, I mean, that's already a tribute. Anyone who can have his children all walking with the Lord is already an achievement. Right. But then to have them all wanting to still be with him and around his home, that's mm. extraordinary. And all still involved in the mission. But the mission has grown. I mean, it's got 10,000-seat auditorium. It's got this phenomenal teacher training college, CEDA International, uh, DSS, the Dominus Servat School. Which has, has several hundred students. It's it sometimes had the top student in the country, right. which is wow. Um, the uh, choirs and they've got several choirs all over the place. Radio Quasi, the largest Christian community radio station in the country, four languages, twenty five hours a day. Uh, really amazing ministry, and that's just the part of it. There's a whole lot more. They have got a farm, massive farm, easily six hundred hectares. Maybe it's more by now. Maybe it's in the 700 hectares. And they're exporting food all over. I mean, Woolworths, many people use their food. And uh, uh, airlines use their food. Very high-quality food. Um, then they've got these phenomenal bottling factories, you know, right. Aquella Water and so on. Funny, because the farm who sold them the farm in 1970 sold the farm because there wasn't enough water there for his cows, which is, gee, that's interesting. Yep. Yes. Now they're shipping millions of liters of a quill of water all over the place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, they've actually got three phenomenal springs with some of the purest water imaginable in the whole country. It's near one of the highest points in the, in the whole of KwaZulu Natal. And Kranskop, which isn't far from them, is one of the highest points, and that's where the aerial is for Radio Quasi. So right. it, it man, means they can broadcast almost everywhere in the whole kingdom of KwaZulu. So very amazing. But there's so many other ministries. I mean, you just trip over the different ministries. It's Doctors for Life, and there's they've got mission bases all over the world. Romania, wow. Russia, Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, France, Switzerland. I've been to many of these mission bases. And uh, uh, it's it just so, um, also Doctors for Life mission base in Mozambique. Uh, their mission work has gone far and wide, even Australia. So, shame. have to feel sorry for the people in Australia. But, no. um, <laughs> Prison Island. Oh, yes. But, uh, all of this from a life well lived. He preached the gospel as an itinerant evangelist for the first 11 years, from 1954 to 1966. The revival hit in 1966. He said up till then he was going to the people with the gospel, but he said after 1966, 
when a revival led, they were coming to him. Amazing. He said, that's the difference. Evangelism is you going to the people. He said, revival is when the people, people come, come to you. In. And and they were just coming and coming. And so much so that they had to build a 10,000-seat auditorium, this massive. It's beautiful. Uh, which is, when they first dedicated 1990, there were 12,000 people crammed in around it. And it was something like a four-and-a-half, five-hour service. The king of the Zulus, King Goodwill Zulantini, Prince Manga Sulu, but lazy with his honored guests. And it was what a celebration. And as you know, the whole auditorium burned down in 2008, rebuilt in 2009, and the second much, much, much better than the first. Right. So uh, you just think of the fruit of a life well lived and uh, what blessing God's poured out on KwaZulu. And, uh, and living waters have gone all over the world. And it's blessed people far and wide, even ourselves. Right. So uh, I just look at this, and here's someone who's run the race. He's kept the faith. He's been productive, energetic. He's done so much. And uh, it's it's a solemn thing to think that there's a generation of great missionaries that are passing away and handing the torch to the next generation. And it's up to us to pick it up and take it further. Has any of the previous successes, especially the ones that you've mentioned, made uh, KSB uh, a target for the government or any other parties oh. with, uh, oh. with male intentions? I Sadly so. In fact, I remember in 1997, some dissidents left Kwasabantu angry about different things. And uh, uh, I remember one of them saying to me personally, mark my words, Kwasabantu won't last another six months. That was 1997. Now, I've heard a lot of that since. There have been some malcontents who have left who have given all kinds of attacks. Uh, and uh, one young girl went to a whole bunch of secular media. She's not that young now, but this was already in the late 1990s. Uh, I escaped from the mission from hell. I mean, that was the title in one of these scandal magazines. And uh, there's some of these Sunday papers that mission of fear, mission of hate, and so on and so forth. And, uh, oh, my. And... Having been there, it was quite laughable to me because, you know, the description was you sort of thought of the Berlin Wall, the Iron Curtain, right. uh, the Stasi walking with the AK-47s and the Dobermans uh, across the minefields and all this. And here she's got to crawl under the barbed wire, you know, with the searchlights going around. I escaped from the mission from hell. Well, all she had to do is walk out the gate. I mean, it's not it's not like anyone's going to restrain you. Right. Not prisoners there. Um, but uh, uh, these kind of slanders, there, there were churches that were encouraged at the AGMs and synods to condemn Kwasabantu, which is ridiculous because if it's not part of your denomination, it's none of your business. Right. Um, uh, at a, a church's AGM or synod to attack another min ministry. But uh, they were attacking all sorts of ways. Well, in 2020, at the beginning of lockdown, News 24, or should I say Newspeak 24, right. or Fake News 24, came out with a exodus exposing a cult in KwaZulu. And it was, oh my, what a lot of nonsense. But they had a lot of reenactments. Now, right. people need to remember reenactments are actors. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not documentation, not photographic evidence. But right. unfortunately, I think most people who watch a reenactment think, ah, it, it was like a horror film. see the character. I mean, they're over and over showing kids getting beaten right. with um, pipes and, and stuff rods. like this. And, you know, honestly. Um, so you really got a, a, a bad impression of KSB from this. But when I analyzed it, it's basically about six people. You know, they go backwards and forth. So you think it's more people. But after a while, it's actually only six people. Right. But I started to recognize immediately, and that's why I wrote an expose on this or in film review and uh, produced a video to counter it because I thought this is so dishonest. Two of the main sources of attacks on, on Cross of Mountain Mission were spies. Not conspiracy theory, I mean, right. fact. So one was Muzi Kaneni, who uh, said that the ANC tasked him to infiltrate KSB in 1979. And he was there all the way through to 1994. And when Mandela became president, he left KSB, let it be known that he had not been a true Christian. He joined the National Intelligence Service. And his main job, we learned in court later, was to smear any body that the government wanted smeared. So right. his his task was to be a character assassin or media publicist assassin as such. And so Mirzi Kanini, in fact, was not just the source of a lot of the tax in KSB. He was the source of some of the scandals. Some of the people who said that they'd been sexually abused and so on was by him. Right. Now, that's an individual, and 
a spy. Then there's Kursi Khrif as the source of most of the attacks in KSB. Well, he had admitted that the previous National Party government had tasked him to infiltrate, to subvert, to watch, to listen, to report back on, on the activities of uh, visitors and so on. And so he's reporting to the security police. So here you've got two self-confessed spies uh, who are the source of a lot of the attacks on KSB. So, I mean, this, regimes. this really looks like there's some government fingerprints. Right. So the, 2020, this, this exodus attack slander against this magnificent ministry of KSB, I began to wonder what's the context. What oh, well, we've got expropriation of compensation, land invasion of plans. Course. So you wonder, could this be part of a plan to discredit a very well-respected, loved mission, internationally known, to discredit them and see how many of their friends will distance themselves and isolate them so that maybe they could be a target for a takeover, yeah. either a hostile takeover from within or a government interference from without. And since then, apparently, they've had every kind of police and government department coming, CRL Commission, Human Rights Commission, uh, welfare, um, youth, uh, right. education, picking and digging and trying to find something. They haven't found anything, but... But um, there's, in fact, those people who claim to be an abuser are not one of them's later charged with the police. Right. Because police will look for evidence, you know. Um, and if it comes to trial, then uh, the courts want evidence, facts. So it's much better to just try them in the media right. with uh, some fake news 24 opinion. with reenactments instead of actual. So there's obviously nothing really substantially there. Right. But greed, malice, jealousy, and maybe political agenda could be part of it. But uh, KSB looked healthy, strong when I was there, and I just praise God that they've endured the storms and the backstabbing. Although they've lost a lot of people who have either fled or have been uh, enticed or were terrified about <gasps> scandal in the media. I mean, right. you, you can appreciate some people would find that very intimidating. So from your visit there and from where you stand, uh, how would you measure KSB's uh, future, whether long term or short term? Well, obviously, it's not just sad uh, to think that Uncle Erlo's uh, time of active ministry is passing away and that while he's still able to communicate and he is still uh, sending out letters and messages, uh, but he's getting weaker and weaker and uh, and obviously his last days are in, in view. So he he is not strong enough to be standing in a pulpit and preaching at the moment. Right. So one's worried and concerned for the future in a sense of, how many of the younger people are going to stand up and fill the gap and carry the torch forward? But the ministry looked healthy. Uh, it looked strong. The uh, 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 auditorium uh, service that I took uh, in the Thursday evening, uh, you could just tell that I recognized so many people, some of whom have been there for many decades, and some of whom are trophies of grace, people who've been converted from drugs and crime and witchcraft, all kinds of backgrounds. And uh, in the morning, I had a ministry with a whole lot of young men who've come in to uh, seek counsel, and many of them come from drug addict and gangster backgrounds. A lot of young men. And uh, obviously very earnest the way they sing. So the spiritual work's going to teach training college is growing. The school is very strong. Uh, the a radio program, very, very popular. Radio Quasi is super successful. Right. So you look at the different components, and, you know, what Uncle Ola has built up is strong and enduring, and uh, I believe it'll stand. The problem is, who can take the place of someone like Ola Stegen? There's not another 10 or 100 men probably in the world who combined could take his place. So in one sense, uh, the ministry is going to suffer a loss. But in the other sense, I think the foundations are good, and uh, there seems to be a lot of dynamic, varied leadership on many different levels. The farmers are very successful. The bottling factory is one of the country's top leaders. Um, they are a successful ministry on so many levels. Uh, the radio station's mega award winning. They've got so many trophies. They've re really got trouble um, displaying them all. Right. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't think that the ministry is in danger, but there are people who are going to try and take advantage and try and attack. And there has been an attempt at internal hijacking, uh, but it seems many of those people have left. It does seem that uh, there are those who would like to take advantage of, of the passing of an era and the founder um, not being able to take an active role. But um, I trust that especially the daughters and 
sons-in-law of Uncle Erlo and his co-workers um, will rise to the occasion, although I must say I'm sure they all feel very unequal to the task. It's got to be intimidating. Right. So we understand that when you did uh, come back from KSB Kwasi Zabantu, uh, you had a very sad duty to perform on the Saturday. Yes. Oh, one of our longest standing board members, Mrs. Dorothea Scarborough, passed around 11th. So um, I was in uh, Mpumalanga at Back to Bible Mission when I heard that Miss Scarborough had died. It wasn't unexpected. She'd been weak for some time, uh, 86 years old. Um, Mrs. Scarborough was, in fact, the longest standing member of our board. Date way back to 1983. I've known her since 1982. After my very first mission to Mozambique, she interviewed me for a Vox Africana magazine and had me speaking to uh, one of her women's groups. And we just stayed in touch and she got more and more involved. And I got involved in United Christian Action, which she is involved in Gospel Defense League's actions. And uh, Mrs. Scott was quite a character. Uh, she grew up in Europe at war. And well, she remembered the first firebombing of any city. Lubbock, her city, was the first city ever firebombed. And the British bombers came over and they first dropped 1.8 ton blockbusters, which blew all the roofs out. And, and she then, remembers all that. Oh, yeah. And then came the, the next two waves, which were dropping incendiaries. They wow. dropped 25,000 incendiary devices, phosphorus bombs on, which burned the whole of Lubbock, which is mostly a wooden city. It's an old medieval city, ancient cultural city. Uh, not of any strategic benefit, nothing of military importance. It was, uh, and that's why it was targeted by Bomber Harris because he said he knew it would burn like a tinderbox because it was mostly made of wood. Burned up the great churches of Lubbock and uh, horrific. So, and they they went through um, ten air raids after that too, and so. But Lubbock was the first firebombing of a city, and uh, uh, the whole city went into inferno. It was deliberately built, uh, designed to to blow out the roofs and then drop inside all these buildings and sendries. And, uh, well, Miss Scarborough had traumatic um, childhood, of course, with that. But she later became a missionary to the Gilbert Islands with the London Missionary Society and uh, uh, to people who were the descendants of cannibals. And mm. it was uh, homeschooling her children on the Gilbert Islands, on the equator, literally on the equator in the Pacific Islands. And when that mission was closed down, because the World Council of Churches persuaded the London Missionary Society and others to close down and declare moratorium on missions because there's something wrong with missions, apparently. Okay. And so they were forced to leave. On their way past Cape Town, on their way back to Europe, her husband her stopped off in Cape Town and went to Seapoint Congregational Church to worship. And they hear a minister of the gospel, and they gave him a call to the pulpit because they didn't have a pastor. And so her husband pastored for 25 years, Seapoint Congregational Church. Mrs. Scarborough knew World Council Church was bad. They just closed down the mission against the pleas of the local people in the Gilbert Downs, pleading with them to stay. So uh, she helped launch, along with her husband, the Evangelical Fellowship of Congregational Churches to enable Congregational Churches to come out of the Southern Council Churches and the World Council Churches and be independent evangelical. And uh, she started to write Yuka News to counter Ecu News. Ecu News came from the World Council Churches. Right. She produced Yuka News, United Christian Action News. Uh, she launched the Gospel Defense League. She's the leader of the Women's World Day of Prayer for many years. So Mrs. Scarborough was phenomenally involved. And, uh, and there were many pastors uh, from Evangelical Fellowship Congregational Churches taking part in the, the funeral service on Saturday. I was one of the pallbearers. I gave uh, the first tribute uh, to Mrs. Scarborough. And she was a founder member of Reformation Society back in 2005, and of Livingston Fellowship back in 2006. And for 15 years, she attended all of our Reformation Society meetings, most stalwart member of the Livingston Fellowship, and a board member of Frontline Fellowship. She is one of my most trusted and valuable uh, advisors and encouragers. Sometimes she is the only board member who is in, encouraging me and standing with me on some very dangerous, controversial, unpopular stands that I was taking. Very firm and faithful friend, steadfast She's really a missionary mother, mobilizer of, of missions and prayer, and uh, a wonderful person. So what a, there's so many battles we fought together, uh, debates, church conferences, councils, Kirchentag in Germany, Sackle Conference in 1986, uh, the Archbishop in a Bible booklet that she printed 100,000 copies of, which I just read about 10,000 copies wow. of. 
And what uh, a really vigorous contender of the face. She is steadfast. Now, uh, Mrs. Scarborough um, looked very gracious and friendly, but she had a doctrinal backbone of steel. She would not back down. She would not bow. She would not bend on any matter of biblical faithfulness or truth or principle. So uh, it's it's uh, been a sore uh, duty to say goodbye to Mrs. Scarborough for now. Um, at the funeral, the pastor said something about this is the end of her life, and I had to correct him say, no, she's going from the land of the dying to the land of the living. This is not the end of her life. Uh, this is the beginning of her eternal life, in fact, that... Um, uh, it's it's wrong to say when a person dies if they're Christian. I mean, remember, death for the Christian is not fatal. Right. Death for the Christian is not final. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Right, and I'm guessing we get to hear more about her life in depth and in pictures uh, this coming. Yes, this Thursday. Thursday is Ascension Day. People shouldn't forget. This Thursday is Ascension Day. Oh, the 26th of um, 26th of May is Ascension Day, and we should observe that, and we do. And our Reformation Society Ascension Day service will include a tribute to the life and legacy of Mrs. Dorothy Scarborough. So anyone in the Cape Town area who can join us, please do. Right, and of course, there's the Great Commission course coming up within the Cape Town area, and uh, I'm sure you have uh, a few details on that as well. Yes, in fact, that's so important. If, if you want to change your world, if uh, if you want to make Christ Great Commission, your supreme ambition, his last command, your first concern. Frontline Fellowship's been running Great Commission courses for well over 25 years. And so uh, we'd encourage you, 24th of June to 13th of July, we will be having a three-week intensive body, mind, and spirit missionary training program, which stretches minds and muscles. It's involving a lot of daily outreaches and hands-on ministry. It's designed to widen your vision, deepen your faith, and give you skills that will make you more effective in missions, wherever you're called to do it, whether part-time, full-time, or in your secular employment, but it's especially designed for cross-cultural missions. And so over the years, uh, we've had participants coming from as far field as Australia and America, Britain and Botswana, Canada and the Congo, Ghana and Germany, from Namibia and New Zealand, from Malawi and Mozambique, Sudan and South Africa, Zambia and Zimbabwe. So the GCC is a very uniquely practical missionary training program. And uh, it involves hikes and PT and backpacks and boots and uh, literature and uh, outreaches and Muslim evangelism and lectures and inspiring uh, practicals. And it will involve exams. It'll involve a whole range of things. But We've had people coming saying, you know, this is the best conference I've ever been to. It's the best thing that's happened in my life. And, of course, you know, because we love nature and wildlife, people get into Newlands Forest, they get up Table Mountain, we get them to meet the eagles, get them to meet cheetahs, we get them who can't come to Africa and not meet some of our wildlife. And uh, uh, they they will do some fun things, you know, get them onto the farm, we'll do some practical workshop. We'll do some self-defense and archery, air rifles and, and uh, target shooting too. So, um, I mean, people, in many cases, we're living in a dangerous world, so we think it's good to have a wide variety. So this is very practical. People will be amazed how much they can fit into a three-week program. And I've had people finishing the GC saying, this is the first time in my life I've led someone to Christ. And mm -hmm. so uh, these are some good things to look forward to. So if people are interested, they can go on the www.frontlinemissionsa.org website either mail mission at frontline.org.za or go on the frontlinemissionsa.org website, look for upcoming events. There's the GC poster. Click on that. You see some videos, uh, pictures, um, read some previous reports, details. Uh, if you're interested, get in touch. We'd love to see you. Amen. And thank you, Dr. Hammond, for being in the studio with us today. Uh, this is From the Frontline, signing out with Ndumiso and Dr. Hammond. <laughs>